If I were to declare to you that we live in an exceedingly wicked and corrupt world, you'd say, have you just now learned that? <laughs> but we do. And things that we used to take for granted in the way of morals and spiritual interest in this nation just simply aren't there anymore among as many people as there once were in this nation. When it comes to the church, the church is like a boat in the water. It was meant to be in the water. That is, the church was meant to be in the world. But the water never was meant to be in the boat. Too much of it and the boat sinks. And we're surrounded by water, the waters of this world. And it's dominated by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the way that the devil approaches each one of us and all other men to seduce us, to transgress God's law, which is sin, 1 John 3, 4. We who have heard the gospel, studied it, understood it, believed it, and obeyed it from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18. For it's God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16 have been freed from our sins when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Baptism, of course, alone saves nobody any more than belief alone saves anybody or the Bible alone saves anybody or the love of God alone saves anybody. Each one of those in its rightful place has to do with the salvation of mankind. Without the gospel, there can be no salvation, for God has located His power to save man from sin in the gospel, Romans 1.16. Thus, it's to be preached to every creature, for through it, God's great grace is extended to lost mankind. Through the terms of the gospel, men may receive what they don't deserve and never could merit, and that is salvation from sin. By believing on the basis of the word that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Obeying the commandment of Acts 17.30 to repent of their sins. Then to confess their faith in Christ, Romans 10 and verse 10. And as I said earlier, to be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. The Lord adds people like that to His church, and only His church. That church which is set out and its identifying marks are found on the pages of your New Testament that set it apart from every religion on the face of this earth. And it's in that church where Christians are found, and only in that church where Christians are found. For that's where the Lord put them. And when they are faithful to the Lord, then they are always ready to meet their Maker. Revelation 2 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. So we live the Christian life. And one of those things that we ever need to be mindful of is our conduct and our appearance to the world and to one another. So for a while this morning, I would like to discuss with you modest apparel. Paul instructed women to adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, if you go back and look at the Greek words in this, you will see that it has to do with uh, cosmeo, which means to put and set in order, from which we get cosmetics. You'll find also it has to do with letting down a garment for the purposes of covering. Paul said, Timothy, you need to know this, and you need to teach it to the brethren. This is a letter to a young preacher. This is something the brethren need to know. This is part of living the Christian life. It's part of being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It also lets us know there's a proper way we're to present our bodies before this world. And if there's a proper way to do it, there's an improper way to do it. Since the Christian religion is fundamentally a taught religion, 
And here is part of the New Testament written to Christians. Most of it is, you know, concerning how to live in the church so that you'll be pleasing to God. Because you can obey the gospel, but you can so live as to lose your soul by becoming unfaithful or totally apostatizing. Now in this passage, we recognize that it is directed to women. We also need to recognize that this does not mean that men can not be immodest. They need to dress modestly also. In the previous verse from this one that we're looking at, 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, instructions were given to men concerning prayer. Timothy needed to know that. Timothy needed to preach that as part of preaching the whole counsel of God to the church. Well, though he addresses men, women also pray. They're instructed to pray. It's part of what they do as children of God, sisters in Christ. They ought to do so. But it's particularly important for men to heed these instructions about prayer since they have a more public role in lifting up prayers. They do so in leadership positions. So the instruction here regarding prayer is directed to men. Now watch it. In the same way the teaching about the need to dress modestly is addressed to women. It doesn't rule the other sex out. This is not because men do not have a responsibility to heed this command, but because women are noticed more for their modesty or the lack thereof. We used to say in summertime, well, it's the naked season. In Houston, it's always the naked season and no telling whatever other kind of immoral season. It goes on all the time and nationwide is the same way. So both men and women need this instruction. Now understand, this is a letter to a preacher, but it's to be preached to members of the church. That means these people are converted to Jesus Christ. They have declared in themselves by their obedience to the gospel, we want to be like Christ. We want to be instructed in how to live the Christian life. It's not like to trying to tell somebody that doesn't even believe in Christ and just of this world, here's the way you ought to, to dress yourself. Well, it is the way they ought to dress themselves. Do you think they're going to pay any attention to it when they don't even believe in Christ nor care about the Bible? So this is said to people who want to know how are we to dress? How are we to dress so that we'll be Christian? Now notice he says, adorn yourselves in modest apparel. Well, that raises a question. What constitutes modest apparel? How do we know what clothing is modest as it's defined here and what is not? I want to know what God thinks about my life. Now, if you do not want to know what God thinks about how you think, what you say, where you go, who you associate with, how you present yourself, then why do you have a Bible in the first place? Why do we sing songs like we just participated in? Holy Bible, book divine, precious treasure, thou art mine. Lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. To guide me. To guide me safely home. Well, it, it can't guide you if you don't study and do what it says. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. 2 Timothy 2, 15. There are those who believe that modest apparel will be determined by our culture. Uh, well, what does that mean? If that's the case, then culture determines uh, whatever. And if the culture changes, then modesty changes. They think that clothing is only immodest if it is viewed that way by society. I heard a, of a man, and I know who he is, who actually made an argument that a woman would be immodest in a two-piece bathing suit if she were around a woman who were completely naked. Now when you got thinking going on like this, sometimes you don't know where to begin. But that's the way people think. And most all of our thinking, I fear, is to justify ourselves in what we like or what we've already been doing and don't want to change. 
We need to remember that in everything, our standard is not the world, but it is the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man the Bible, rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2.15. It would be unreasonable for God to demand His people to dress modestly, but not show them what that is. Not make it impossible for them to understand. It's like saying, you need to be saved from your sins. But he never tells us what sin is, and he doesn't tell us how to be saved from our sins. So he tells us that we're to dress modestly. But he, he won't tell us in the Bible what that is. That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, there are several passages in the Old Testament that help provide God's definition of what he considers to be modest. <coughs> Now, some may point out at this point in our study that, well, we're under the authority of Christ in the New Testament today and therefore cannot go to the Old Testament to show what modest apparel is. Well, again, that reveals a lack of understanding of the right division of the Word of God. Paul said in Romans 15, 4, in writing part of the New Testament, that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And that's the Old Testament Scriptures. So there are principles and there are definitions and there are insights in the Old Testament that help us when we comply only with the authority of Christ and the words of the New Testament. It's certainly true that we're under the new law. Nobody's saying we're not. And the Old Testament is not the law for us today. Now the writer of Hebrews labored to get that point across, especially in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 13, and showing the purpose and design of the law of Moses over and against the perfect law of liberty, James 1 and verse 25. But remember now, we're not appealing to the Old Testament for our law, but we're appealing to it for definitions. Our law, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, states that we are to dress modestly. Now that's either a true statement, it's God's will, or it's not. There's no gray area in logic. The law of the excluded middle is certainly followed. It is or it's not. We are expected to do what he said since it's part of living the Christian life in a faithful manner as taught in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. But what God considers, and that's all I'm interested in right now, what God considers modest or naked is not outlined in the New Testament completely. You have to look at the whole thing. Now, we look at the whole thing to make it even more clear. Does that mean we can invent our own definitions for these terms? Well, a lot of people think so. Unbelief is simply saying, yes, I know that's what it says. Guess what follows? But I don't think. That just simply means, yes, I understand it. Yes, that's God's word. I don't believe it. Now, you won't find many people saying that. But that's exactly what happens, and it's true when it comes to a subject like this that impacts great men, members of the church as to how they dress. So we don't invent our own definitions. We don't come up with new terms. God has given us the terms. God has defined the terms. Our obligation is to ascertain what they are, what they mean. The fact that the definitions are found in the Old Testament is irrelevant. God's law has changed, but uh, our bodies have not changed. Evolution, the contrary notwithstanding. I don't see any lizards out here this morning. Therefore, what God considered naked in Genesis is what he considers naked today. Now, did everybody hear that? What God considers naked in Genesis is what he considers naked today. So, I want us to look at, to the Word of God, to the authority of God, to the totality of the teaching of God on this subject, both the Old and New Testaments, to help us see what modest apparel is is now following creation before the introduction of sin into the world Adam and Eve were both naked and they were not ashamed Genesis 2.25 I've often thought about the way things are going now with some adults can be naked today and be not ashamed but it's for a totally different reason 
they don't care. They have been taught that such does not matter. There was uh, someone told me the other day at one of these community swimming holes that the man just got outside of his car there on the street and stripped off his pants and his underwear and put on his bathing suit. Didn't bother him at all, right in the street. I firmly believe if it wasn't for the laws of the land, there'd be plenty of people to strip off completely and run around naked as a jaybird. And I suggest that you need to go look at a little nest full of jaybirds, little babies, and you'll know what I mean by naked as a jaybird. When we come to Genesis chapter 3, things change because sin entered the world. I don't even think any of us realize what a radical change uh, came about because men broke God's will and opened the door for Satan to influence this world. God is flawlessly just, and when man broke his law, it changed everything. Now, yes, he made provision through the great scheme of redemption with the Bible records as it unfolds down through history for man to be forgiven but he meant this world never could be the same again. Satan came to Eve in the form of a serpent. And he solicited her to sin. He tempted her to eat of the one tree that God commanded them not to eat. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2.17. Satan even told Eve when she ate it, she would be like God, knowing good and evil, Genesis 3 and verse 5. This is exactly what would happen. So eating of the, this fruit would cause them to know what was good and what was evil. He didn't tell them the rest of the story, and that's the way that Satan operates. And he knows what we want to hear, so he tells us what we want to hear. And a lot of it can be the truth, just enough truth without telling us the whole truth to get us to do what he wants us to do, which is to sin. Because sin, as I say over and over again, is the only thing to keep you out of heaven. The only thing to separate you from God. There is nothing else. Jesus came for one reason, to solve the sin problem. And he did. After both Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the scripture says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Genesis 3, 7. I don't understand all how that happens with adults man and woman because I've never known any adult men and women that were as innocent as these little babies I don't know whatever else all happened but I know there was a radical change in man because he violated God's will in an attempt to remedy this situation they recognized they were naked they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons actually Loin coverings is a better translation of the Hebrew, Genesis 3, 7. So they had these loin coverings, coverings, but then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden, Genesis 3, 8. Well, the Lord calls to Adam, Genesis 3, 9. And Adam explained why he and Eve hid themselves. I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Genesis 3.10. And that's when God said, who told you you were naked? Because you see, an innocent child doesn't understand those things. So this evidence is already what a change has come upon this man. So despite these Aprons or loin coverings. Adam and Eve realized they were still naked. The Lord then asked Adam what I just said. And then said, have you eaten of the tree of which I command you not to eat? Well, God knew that. This tells us something about how God operates many times. God did not need to ask these questions because he didn't know. He asked those questions to impress upon Adam what he had done. That needs to be kept in mind when you're studying the scriptures to understand how God works with man. God knew where they acquired the knowledge of what constituted nakedness. And you see that in this question. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were told not to. They did. They transgressed God's law. All these things changed for the worse. The knowledge of good and evil would include knowledge of proper and improper coverings. 
And with their newfound knowledge, they understood that being partially clothed was still to be considered naked. Now, did you get that? To be partially clothed was still to be considered naked. Now, you may say, I just don't agree with that. You know, I really don't care, except that you're not agreeing with God, and how do you expect to come out for the better when you do that? Shouldn't we have the attitude, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command, and I will obey whatever view I have that when I study the Bible, I see that it's different from God's view? Guess what? I'm going to repent and change, and I'm going to embrace God's view. There are multiplicity of people out here in this world that think they're Christians, and their worship right now is being accepted with God, and yet they deny the plan of salvation. Are they saved? Not if the Bible's true and God means what he says, says what he meant in the book. Well, is it only true when it comes to the plan of salvation and each step therein? Or is it true on matters of this nature also? It's true on everything that God says. After confronting Adam and Eve and the serpent, the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Genesis 3.21 So here's proper clothing. Is God made clothing? I want you to think about that for a minute. God made clothing. When you follow the teachings of God, found only in His written word, you do what He said and the way He said it for the reason He said it or whatever else is involved in keeping the commandments, doing what He's authorized, obeying the Lord, then it's a God made whatever it is except the Lord build the house the Bible says they labor in vain in building what is that teaching us is there anything it says you must do it God's way you must submit to his authority and people don't like that nowadays in America right now there's a general attitude toward authority that's pitiful you don't like it you don't do it in fact, feelings outweigh facts, and that's fact. <laughs> if you don't feel good, if you don't feel like it, if it doesn't suit you, it doesn't even make any difference if that's a microphone. It's not going to be a microphone to you because you don't want to be a microphone. If you want to be a potato masher, fine, that's what it will be. And if I remind you, no, that thing was created in a microphone and I define what a microphone is related to a PA system, well, you don't have it that way. So it's going to be a potato masher. And so on you go on with that kind of thing. And so it is when it comes down to many things regarding how to become a Christian, the church, its organization, work, its worship, and now especially in living the Christian life and individual conduct and parents' responsibility to teaching their children right from wrong. And that covers modesty, by the way. Now, what were these garments that God made for them? What part of their bodies did God cover so they would no longer be naked? God's definition of naked. Well, according to Strong's, the Hebrew word means a garment that went from the shoulders on down. Let's start with that. From the shoulders on down chests of the body and the backs of the body after doing this uh, they were clothed and no longer naked now somebody that's astute or trying to find a way out of it one or the other you know, a lot of them ask the same questions really wanting to know the truth and really trying to get out of it a lot of the same questions come up how far below the waist needed to be covered <coughs> To the ankle, to the knee, halfway down the thigh, all the way to the ankles with a slip cut up to the never you mind. People are ingenuous at being able to figure out ways to break God's will. But that means we have to go to other passages in the Bible to help us determine this particular answer. In God's instructions regarding the clothing for the priests of the law of Moses, he said, You shall make 
for them linen breeches to cover their bare flesh. King James says nakedness. They shall reach from the loins even to the thighs. Well, that's helping us some if you know what loins and thighs are. And what was considered nakedness? Exposing the loins and or the thighs. Now we've already seen what's upstairs. We're trying to figure out what's downstairs as far as naked and not naked, modest and immodest. Another helpful passage is found in the great prophetic book Isaiah, verses 47 through uh, chapter 47, verses 2 through 3. He writes, Remove your veil. He talks about taking off or stripping off the shirt. Talks about uncovering the leg, the thigh in the King James Version. Cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame also will be exposed. Well, I can read and understand that. My own mother tongue translated from the Hebrew. When one's thigh is uncovered, you're considered naked. Begin to get God's definition of what's naked and what's not. If it's naked, it ought to be covered. What God says naked ought to be covered. And that is still tying in with the matter of being dressed in modest apparel. Now, before we go further with this, and if you're going to ask me to say, well, does it mean one inch below the knee or mid-knee? I can't say that because the Bible doesn't. But it comes right down at least to the knee. It goes beyond the thigh. And it covers the chest up to the neck and the back. Now, I want to pause here and, and say this because, you see, you can have all of that on and yet have it on so tight that you couldn't tell you had it on. And yet still be immodest. So you see, these principles are laid out because people who want to know will know, and they'll make sure they abide by in these general principles, but they'll realize also you can have the whole body covered and still be uh, emphasizing what you should. Because if you look at the whole of what is said and, uh, by Paul to Timothy, he'll talk about the women not being adorned in all of this gaudy, secular Hollywood glitter to draw attention to themselves that way. And he'll tell them you ought to be drawing attention to yourself because you're one of a meek and quiet spirit and you're godly conduct in life. That's what a Christian does. So I know that being dressed modestly goes beyond just those things that means your nakedness is covered. You cannot allow yourself to be put into certain pigeonholes where the person who has no knowledge of God's will says well look at that person he claims to be a Christian he's just like all the rest of us heathens now you had a problem with that that fits in well at this study in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 where the church was in all sorts of messes and every way under the sun and Paul had to deal with them And he talks about the matter of long hair. Really, he's talking about coverings. He's talking about living in a society where the culture said if the woman wasn't completely veiled, she was not showing reverence to her head or her husband. And Paul reasons this way. If you're not going to wear that covering... You might as well have your head shorn. And they wouldn't do that because that meant I'm an advertising prostitute. Now that tells me something when you go in different parts of the world where they have different customs. Listen to me. When you go into different parts of the world and they have different customs and those customs already are in harmony with God's will, you don't break them. Or people who don't know the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, won't understand what you're doing. And here in Corinth, some of these Christian women were saying, well, we're free in Christ. We'll just throw off 
our veils. Well, these people out here who are ignorant of the truth and who upheld these cultural whatevers took a dim view of that as to what that represented about this woman and her attitude toward her head who was man, her husband. And this is where, and if you noticed it in the reading, what Paul said, Gary, can you put that reading back up here that we had just a while ago? Because it bears directly on this. The one that we had is our regular reading this morning in the worship. Can you get that up there all right or will it be too much trouble? I want us to look at that for a minute. Because it discusses fundamentally Paul's inspired attitude about the very thing I'm trying to get over right now. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. I think a lot of brethren don't believe that. A lot of them know what it means. Expedient means it's advantageous. Well, he says all things are lawful. That is, whatever is authorized, I am to do, Colossians 3.17. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to do for the good of the church. That's exactly what he's saying. All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things don't edify, don't build up the church. Which is saying, even though I have authority for it, in consideration of the other people and their knowledge or lack of it, I still don't do it. Now, if he's not saying that, what would he write to say it? Let no man seek his own. Well, that mocks the American attitude right down the line because everybody in America says, I'm here and I have my rights and nobody takes my rights away from me and I'm going to do what I want to do. Let no man seek his own. You know the power of let? It's a commandment. This is an inspired teaching of Christian conduct. Don't make your choices of what you're going to be and do on the basis of what I like, what I want, my way. Are you going to? It's going to be trouble if I don't get it. Let no man seek his own. Well, what are we to seek then? Ooh, look at that other one. But every man another's wealth. I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about people in their ignorance, how they may view what I do or I don't do, where I go and what I don't do. If it doesn't mean that, let me ask you again, what would he have to write to mean it? Whatsoever sold to the shambles, now we're dealing with their situation at that time where they sold food, that eat asking no question for conscience sake. What's he talking about? Well, they sold all this, this meat that was offered to those idols. Most people were idols. They sold those things in the local cafes, in the eateries. Whatsoever soul in shambles, that eat asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is Lord of the Lord. You know, you're enlightened, you're a Christian. You know there's nothing to this meat. It's just meat cooked. Well, watch. If any of them that believe not bid you to feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But whose conscience sake? But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice to an idol, eat it not, for his sake it showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? In other words, I've got to realize I understand there's nothing to these idols. Thus the meat offered to them is nothing but meat, and it's sold in the shambles, and I order it. I'm not going to ask one way or the other what it is. I'm going to sit down and eat my meal. But if you go somewhere and they do this, and it's an idolater who's saying this, then don't eat it, not because of you, but because of him. You don't want to cause problems with him and his ignorance of the truth. For if, by grace be, uh, for if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? For that for which I give thanks. Whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all the glory of God. This is a discussion of how I deal with other people in their situation in matters that are not necessarily wrong. In fact, they're not wrong. I still must be concerned about the other person. We don't think that way in America. If I've got a right to do it, I ought to be allowed to do it. Paul didn't say that. You know, he could have ended that whole thing, but he's writing what I just said. If I've got a right to do it in Christ, I've got a right to do it. Forget about what anybody else thinks about me. Bring that over to the instructions on modesty if we've studied it. 
Same principle, it doesn't disappear because we move over here concerned about the other person, how he views who we are and what we are and where we are. Then I've got to be concerned about what other people think, even when I'm dressed modestly. So when I'm in a culture that holds some things to be fine, and they are, they're not out of harmony with the Lord's will, such as in Corinth and the veil they wore, I still abide by those things because to do otherwise would create a wrong attitude and the person doesn't understand the truth. You know, I guess we would do better on this kind of discussion if we had people that were beyond the plan of salvation and ready to chew on something that's a little bit meaty rather than always sucking on a bottle of milk. Because you've got to do some reasoning here. You've got to realize what he's saying. When he says, I became all things to all men that I might win some, he's talking about considering the other person. He's talking about matters of indifference, but if they make a difference to him, he's going to be concerned about what he does about it. And I've used this over and over again. Indonesia and Arab countries, don't use your left hand. This is where my left hand stayed when I was in those countries, just so I could keep it and not use it wrong. Well, what in the world does the Bible say about being a sin to use your left hand? Nothing. Except right there. Right here. I didn't want to offend those people. Because it was something to them. In America, where anything goes, we don't have much of that kind of stuff. But I would show you, let's just suppose for a moment, I've used the illustration over and over again, let's just suppose for a moment that you had Jewish neighbors and you made good friends with them and they're living as Jews live according to their view of what's right and honoring the dietary laws. So you want to invite them over for supper. You're going to serve them pork. You think you would uh, offend them? Well, yes, but I'm a Christian. I'm at liberty. That doesn't mean anything to me. They're going to come over to my house. They're going to eat pork like it. I'm a Texan and this barbecue pork and they're going to live in Texas. They're going to convert. Well, does that sound like what Paul said when he's saying consider the other person? So we're talking about matters that in themselves make no difference. We're bringing it over to modesty. It's plain that it makes a difference what God thinks nakedness is and what God thinks ought to be covered up when he says be dressed modestly. But it also adds to it these things regarding clothing and conduct. I started once to do this, and I just didn't want to go through the trouble with it, tell you the truth. But some of you know that I have a full Arab regalia. And I started once to put that on and wear it this morning. If I could have figured out how just to get up here all of a sudden with it on, I'd done it. You know, I, you know, to do that routinely in our society and in the way we do things, even though we have uh, lots of uh, Arabs and Middle Eastern people all around, but for me to wear that here, you know, I'd be modest. Yet I guarantee you, you're going to be all the nakedness covered up better than most people in America. Why would it be immodest? It wouldn't be, I, I would be standing out from everybody else with the routine way all of us live. I'd draw attention to myself unwarranted for no reason. Now, frankly, I think it'd be good in men in the wardrobes if all, all we had to do was wrap up in different sheets. It'd be a lot easier. But... Uh, <laughs> There's things like that. I remember walking down, and I'll close here. I hope you're able to put this together as I mean it. Walking down the old city, the street of Jerusalem one night in the old city. I was dressed basically like this. And as we rounded a sharp corner, because these streets had been there from maybe the time of David. I don't know that. Well, I'm serious when I say that. As we rounded the corner, we met an Arab lady. She was all in black. And there were three of us, and we were all dressed about like I am now. And as we met her, she drew to the other side of the street, which wasn't hardly twice as wide as this podium, covered her face, and turned to the wall, and she passed me. I think she's a very modest lady. And what she had on, 
And in her culture in that place, if she believed, she did. And I wouldn't try to talk her out of it. Do you understand then in matters that are indifferent, but people in places who are not Christians or have the knowledge of Christ, yet those customs uphold things the Bible teaches? That's why Paul could write what he did about the head covering and say you ought to keep your heads covered. And by the way, that covering, if you'll look it up, in Corinth was a full covering all the way almost down to the feet. Paul says... Don't create the wrong view because you're a Christian. Those things don't make any difference anymore that you take that off your head. You're going to send the wrong message. So there was somebody that was completely modest in every way the Bible talks about covering nakedness. If she had taken any of it off, though, she was sent the wrong message because of the customs and how the people who without knowledge of Christ and understanding the liberty we have in Christ would have understood her to be. So you've got the actual problem of people just being naked and need to be clothed like the Bible says being clothed. And then you've got the problem of recognizing other people's situations as I've just described at the end of the lesson. It wouldn't be hard to understand these things if we would just take time to study and think about it and not be so determined to do things we want to do because we've got the right to do it. So the law of Christ instructs us to dress modestly. The law of Christ teaches us what is naked and what is not. I say the law of Christ, I mean the totality of the Bible, for it all was meant to be studied by all of us when we rightly divide it. So if we're not a Christian, you know, we've already studied today the simple plan of salvation to become a Christian. We studied something about when you're converted, you live like Christ wants you to live, even when it comes to understanding what God says nakedness is and how to cover it up, and even when it comes to considering things that are not wrong within themselves and how you deal with people that don't have proper knowledge as you live righteously before them lest you truly cast a stumbling block and cause them to rebel against the Lord. If you're a child of God and you sin, we urge you to repent, confess it in God's second law of pardon and pray God for forgiveness. Let's rejoice in the exceeding great and precious promises we have and be ready always to submit to God's will when we see we're not. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we then invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.